Good evening, everyone. I'm Francesca Gaines. I'm the Head of Politics here at the University of Manchester. And it's my pleasure to welcome you and our distinguished speaker, uh, the Right Honourable John Burko, for this annual Sami Finer lecture in this beautiful council chamber in the Whitworth Hall. Sami Finer was born 100 years ago and 50 years ago became head of what was then the Department of Government. So he was my predecessor. Finer was a towering figure in the development of the study of politics. He wrote seminal works on comparative government, which helped shape our discipline and informs the study of politics today. In more recent times here at Manchester, we've changed our name. We are now a Department of Politics and International Relations to reflect the modern study of politics. And part of what we want to do here at Manchester is offer opportunities to debate issues of contemporary relevance outside the classroom <coughs> and to members of the public, to a wider audience. So we decided to honour the legacy of Sami Finer and host an annual lecture in his name so that we could examine current political issues and open it up to students, staff members and um, other members of the public. So we're absolutely delighted to welcome John Burko tonight to give the Sami Fine lecture. John Burko was elected to Parliament in 1997 as the Conservative Member of Parliament for Buckingham. He was elected Speaker of the House of Commons in 2009 and again <coughs> in 2015, an election which speaks to cross-party recognition of his stature and standing amongst parliamentary colleagues. During his time in office, he's been known for taking a fair and robust approach to defending the right of the legislature to challenge the executive. He's seen as a reforming speaker, working tirelessly to make the sometimes archaic traditions of the House of Commons more accessible and relevant to the public. Part of that involved overseeing the development of the parliamentary outreach team and in establishing um, parliamentary studies links with several universities, including Manchester. I think both Sami Finer and the speaker, our speaker, uh, share a legacy of examining how parliamentary government works and how to make it work better. So given the aims of our Sami Finer lecture and the speaker's reforming agenda, there really is no better person to give this lecture this year on the making of a modern parliament. Also on the platform is my predecessor as head of politics, Professor Andrew Russell, who is now leading our partnership with the parliamentary outreach team. And after the lecture, Andrew is going to help facilitate a Q&A with the speaker. And afterwards, you're all cordially invited to join us to have a glass of wine in the foyer downstairs. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure you're facing a far better behaved audience than you're used to here this evening. <laughs> and I understand that yesterday in Parliament was especially raucous. Uh, I'm sure there's no need for me to urge anyone to calm down this evening. <laughs> and it's our turn to hear what's coming next. So can I invite you? to give our lecture on the making of a modern parliament. Well. well, Francesca, thank you for the warmth and generosity of that welcome. I'm bound to start students by saying that having heard myself introduced, I can hardly wait to hear myself speak. <laughs> Whether you'll feel the same way at the end, of course, is a matter for legitimate speculation and conjecture, but I'm absolutely delighted, Francesca, Andrew, friends and colleagues, to be here. And there are two principal reasons why I'm delighted to be here. First, the University of Manchester is a genuinely high-achieving and widely celebrated institution with an incredibly strong and well-developed politics faculty reflected in the numbers of respected academics here and in the level of interest in and commitment to politics degrees, undergraduate and also post 
graduate to boot. An important component of your evolution as an institution is the introduction of the Parliamentary Studies module, which has come about as a result of a conscious collaboration between universities on the one hand and parliamentary authorities on the other. And that seems to me to augur very well for your development. I should just add, almost in parenthesis, that part of the rationale for the creation of the module and our attempted proselytization amongst universities to gain acceptance for it was a sense in Parliament that although a lot of people have studied politics, studied politics at undergraduate level, studied politics in some cases at postgraduate level, awareness of Parliament and its functioning was comparatively limited and it would be perfectly possible to acquire a degree in politics with no significant familiarity with Parliament itself. And that seemed to me, in a sense, to be a deficit that needed to be bridged. So that's the first reason why I'm thrilled to be here. The second reason why I'm delighted to be here is that it is the occasion of the Sammy Finer lecture. And I don't come to you under false pretenses. I didn't know him. I wasn't privileged to meet him. But I was very aware of the significance of S.E. Finer, as he used to be known when I was a university student, when I was studying government at the University of Essex in the 1980s. He certainly was a giant in the field of academic political science. He and I happen also to have one thing in common, and that is our family heritage. Finer's forefathers were Romanian, and he had a lifelong interest in Eastern and Central Europe. As it happens, amongst his various other political interests, he had a strong interest in the development of the State of Israel. I myself am of Jewish origin. I'm not a strongly religious person, but I've always had a kind of ethnic identification with my background, my past, my grandparentage, if you like. And my grandparents came over to this country on the onion boat from Romania on my father's side at the turn of the century. So that we have in common. But he was a huge figure and he had a very distinguished academic career, most notably here at Manchester, but spanning spells at Staffordshire, Keel University, and indeed at Oxford as well. And he was very actively involved as chair of the Political Studies Association and for some time as a vice chair of the International Political Science Association. So he was very much part of that set, committed to the teaching of politics, not merely as a career, but as a calling, as a vocation, as a personal passion, if you will. And I've mentioned one of his interests in Israel and doubtless in his own heritage, but he was very interested in the study of institutions, in the notion of pluralism and liberal democracy. And his best known work was the history of government since the earliest times, which I think it is fair to say, by virtue of its breadth and scope, as well as its academic pedigree, would represent a fairly challenging read for quite a lot of students. It might not be a racy page turner, but it was a very highly regarded work at the time and for a long time subsequently. So for all of those reasons, I'm pleased to be here. I am moved at the outset to treat of one quite sensitive matter before I address more serious subjects, which I suspect probably your natural courtesy will disincline you to raise with me directly, but which will lurk perilously in the undergrowth if I don't knock it on the head at the beginning, and that is the vexed and sensitive matter of height. Uh, very specifically, it has been suggested that I'm the shortest man ever to be speaker. Now, there's nothing wrong with being short. We short people amongst those in the audience who share that characteristic with me, and I should stick together. We may be short, but we might also be and judge ourselves to be perfectly formed. <laughs> And I am short, I'm 53 years old, and I remain short, and given the known impact of the aging process on physiognomy, the great likelihood, my friends, is that I shall become inexorably and irrevocably shorter still. And about the fact of that continued and soon to be exacerbated shortness, I am as intensely relaxed. As Peter Mandelson once famously said, New Labour was intensely relaxed about people getting filthy rich. 
but I'm not intensely relaxed about the matter of historical accuracy in which you would expect the Speaker of the House to take some interest. And simply as a matter of fact, it's quite wrong when some of these more down-market scribblers say, oh, well, Burko is the shortest man ever to be Speaker. Sir John Bussey, <laughs> Speaker of the House from 1394 to 1398, <laughs> Sir John Wenlock, Speaker 1455 to 1456, and Sir Thomas Tresham, Speaker in 1459, are all believed to have been shorter than I am. Although I do have to admit that this was true only after all three of them had been beheaded. <laughs> Indeed, no fewer than seven of my predecessors met their end on the executioner's block. One was killed in battle. And a further Speaker was brutally murdered, so you will understand that this does enable me to view the woes and challenges which afflict and confront the House, and which I readily concede periodically afflict and confront me with an appropriate sense of historical perspective. That is to say, whatever else happens to me, I am not likely to lose my head. And I'm delighted to be with you tonight, and the subject of which I've been informally, I suppose, invited to treat in this talk stroke lecture is the making of a modern parliament. And I would like to deal with this in three forms. First, to say something to you about the role of the speaker in the chair. Secondly, to say something about the speaker as a broker of, a catalyst for, a well-wisher to necessary and desired reform, both in the formal operations of Parliament as a legislature and in its capacity or character as a workplace. And finally, to say something about the function, perhaps, of the Speaker, if you don't judge it presumptuous, as an ambassador for Parliament. And I want to leave plenty of time for questions, so let me try to deal with each of these three with such economy as I can muster. First, the role of the Speaker in the chair. I'm working on the assumption that a lot of you will be conscious that the Speaker in our system is expected, nay, required to be an impartial figure. And the seriousness with which the British Parliament takes that concept of expected and obliged impartiality is underwritten or proven by the fact that when the Speaker becomes Speaker, he or she is expected to renounce party, literally to divorce him or herself from party, to be independent of, separate from, unconnected with, owing no allegiance to, I could hardly put it more clearly, any political party. And although it's not written down, because we don't have a written constitution, it's not in statute, the expectation is that that impartiality, or at any rate that freedom from party, is a permanent freedom from the moment the person becomes speaker to the rest of his or her days. So I am expected to be a referee or an umpire and to be and to be able to be seen to be unconnected with a political party. I was previously a Conservative MP as Francesca has pointed out. Indeed, I was a Conservative MP for 12 years and a member of the Conservative Party for 29. But as Speaker, I have no party membership at all. I resigned as a member of the Conservative Party on the 22nd of June 2009 in a letter to the then Chairman of the Conservative Party, Eric Pickles, literally on the night of my election. And in my capacity as Speaker in the Chair, which is by far the best known and most visible, but by no means the only function of the Speaker, I am really a referee or an umpire. My responsibility is to keep order, to encourage people to take part, and to try to cut down on the number of people who have to be excluded altogether as a result of bad behavior. So of course I have to know who everybody is, I have to know all of my colleagues' names, I have to know the constituencies they represent, and there is a working assumption, my friends, at least in respect of key controversies, not necessarily on every issue before the House, the Speaker will have an idea of where colleagues are coming from on the matter under discussion. That knowledge on the part of the Speaker of people's viewpoint is not to be used, and no one should suppose such, as 
a weapon of censorship. It's not in order to try to deny people the chance to say what they think. Rather, it is to try to facilitate the freest and fairest and most extensive discussion of the subject matter at hand. So, at question time, be it an ordinary ministerial question time, or at Prime Minister's question time, I have to call the people on the order paper. And they're there on the order paper because we have a ballot each day. And they have been successful in that ballot. And so their names are on the list to be called. And whether I wish to call them or not, my friends, I have to call them to ask their questions. But aside from that, if you ever watch parliamentary proceedings, you'll often see people constantly standing up in between questions and during debates when one speech is finished, a large number of people might suddenly stand. And the reason for that is that standing in the Commons in those circumstances is directly analogous to raising your hand in a classroom or a lecture theatre because you wish to ask a question. It is a member's means of signalling to the chair a desire to take part in the discussion taking place at the time. Literally, in the old-fashioned jargon, the member is trying to catch the speaker's eye. And the speaker, in deciding who to call, is motivated by a number of considerations. The need to go back and forth between government and opposition sides. The need to ensure that women who on the whole are better behaved than the male members are called to ask their questions or make their speeches. The need to ensure that people who are elected in 2015 or a by-election since get the chance to put their questions, as well as those who've been around 40 years or more, and a great many in between. The need to ensure that Scotland, Welsh, and Northern Irish members of Parliament are called to contribute, as well as those from England, and from different parts of the different territories within the UK. And, to go back to something I said a moment ago, I'm trying to ensure a balance of opinion. So on something like Brexit, OK, decided now by the referendum, but still a very hot potato within Parliament and likely to remain so for some time to come, it's up to me to know who are the key players on the Conservative side, Bill Cash, and Bernard Jenkin, and Christopher Chope, and Philip Davis, and David Nuttall, people like that, some well-known, others less, a very strong anti-EU people, but there are Conservative members who are rather more pro-EU, of whom the best known, of course, is Ken Clark, but there are other examples. Anna Subri, Nicky Morgan, Alistair Burt, Neil Carmichael, people like that. And I'm looking to ensure that they have their chance to contribute. And then on the Labour side, there are a lot of pro-Europeans, of whom probably the best known are people like Keith Vaz and Hilary Benn and Alan Johnson. But there are Labour members who are pretty anti-EU, of whom Kate Hoey, Gisela Stewart, Kelvin Hopkins, Dennis Skinner are all good examples. I'm not trying to advance one opinion or to retard the expression of another. I'm trying to facilitate the widest exchange. Can I please everybody? What are those pigs I see flying in front of my very eyes? It's completely impossible to satisfy everybody. But what I am trying to do in the interests of a modern parliament is to maximize the exchange. And what that means in practice is that I've got to try to keep the session running at a swift pace. So I'm looking to call as many people as possible, which means on the whole, short questions and reasonably short <coughs> answers. And when I stood for Speaker, I had a general sense in the House of disaffection with the slow progress of question time. And whether I'm any good as Speaker is ultimately not for me to say. That's for you and others to judge. But I have sought to do what it said on the tin when I stood back in 2009, namely to hasten progress. So I often say, well, you know, we've got the gist of it. Or if the minister launches into a long reply, I will sometimes say, again, you know, we've got the gist of it. Perhaps if we could have the abridged rather than the war and peace version, we can make progress to the next question. Now, that I think is quite relevant because more so now than in parliaments of old, Partly because of a sense of duty and professionalism, and I use the term professionalism non-pejoratively, people are there because they are their profession is what they do for a living, and partly because we're in an age of transparency with websites that 
track what people do, how often they speak, in which debates they contribute, which motions they sign. People want to be heard on behalf of their constituents and their party and their principles, and their constituents want them to be heard. So I would say that far more now than in the past, most people want to take part quite regularly. The age of the so-called gentleman amateur who strolls into the house and sits for months or possibly even years without taking part has gone, and I think that's a good thing. So I like to think that I have made a modest contribution to advancing the range and speed of exchange in Parliament, but overwhelmingly, insofar as we've made any progress in that regard, it's down to colleagues. It's down to colleagues taking their cue and making their input. I said that I would say something about the role of the speaker as a facilitator of or catalyst for desired and presumably therefore necessary change in the operation of the legislature and the functions more widely of Parliament. Let me broach this issue as pithily as I can. When I stood for election, it was in the immediate aftermath of the reputational carnage inflicted colleagues by the expenses scandal. So we were not just in bad odor, we were subject to huge public opprobrium. And of course, I, with other candidates, said we have to have our house put in order by an external body charged with responsibility for determining what legitimate costs are for members of parliament to be able to claim for going about their parliamentary duties. But if any of my colleagues thinks that that is all we need to do or to cause to have done, and we can then assume all is well with the world, I think that colleague is deluded on an industrial scale. My basic sense back in 2009 was that for a long period, disillusionment with politics and politicians had set in for a plethora of reasons. The power of government had increased, was continuing to increase, and needed, in my view, to be checked or reduced, of which the corollary students was that the power of parliament had decreased, was continuing to decrease, and needed to be increased. Now, there are all sorts of other factors at the root of the political malaise, and we can treat of those in questions if you want, but I would like to focus on this particular point, because it's relevant to my responsibility as a speaker, that government had become more powerful, not necessarily more popular, but more powerful, with greater resources, with greater weapons at its disposal, with greater capacity to shape the political and parliamentary agenda, but parliament had, in a sense, regressed and become less significant under governments of both colours. So I said, look, the Speaker can't do everything, but if you elect me, first of all, I think we ought to improve progress at question time, which is substantially down to the Speaker, and I've just referenced this. So if you elect me, I intend that we proceed at a brisker pace. But I would like to make a number of other propositions to colleagues which they might want to consider. In my view, I said back in 2009, it's completely ridiculous that the deputy speakers, of whom there are three, are all appointed by the political parties, by effectively the government and opposition whips offices. They have no democratic mandate at all. The deputy speakers should be elected by the whole House. The House should take control of this function and say to the whips, up with your control, we will no longer put. We are going to take charge of this matter. I said to colleagues, I think it's completely ridiculous that the chairs of the select committees which scrutinise the executive, scrutinise the expenditure policy and administration of individual government departments, are hand-picked by representatives of that very executive. Before 2010, the chairs of the select committees were appointed by government and opposition whips as a prize for good behaviour or a penalty for bad. And I say, colleagues, I think that there's no good people coming up to me in the course of this election saying we completely agree with you, John, standing on a programme of parliamentary reform, but we can't say anything ourselves because we have this position or that position or the other position and we mustn't upset our party leader or our chief whip. I said to colleagues, colleagues, if you want parliament to be respected again, 
we collectively and individually have to recover some self-respect. We've got to be prepared simply to say, we, the majority of parliamentarians, are going to insist on X rather than Y. And if you agree with me that select committee chairs should be elected by secret ballot of the whole house, we've got to resolve to make that happen. And I said, I personally think also members of select committees should be elected proportionate to their representation of parties in the house, but they should be elected by their parties. They shouldn't be appointed by the chief whip. And I said, I think it's ridiculous that all business in the house is scheduled by the government and opposition whips behind closed doors. I think we ought to have a, at the very least a backbench business committee which schedules non-government business, that is not legislation from government, but other debates in accordance with the preferences of backbench members of parliament, perhaps in concert with or operating on behalf of or having received representations, written or electronic petition or whatever, from constituents. Surely we should have a backbench committee that chooses the business at least one day a week. Now, interestingly, colleagues, other candidates started to articulate similar points of view, and there was actually in the end, not quite a consensus, but quite a strong view amongst the ten of us standing for Speaker that these changes should be made. And after I became Speaker, there was a report on the subject of the election of Deputy Speakers, an election of Deputy Speakers happened in 2010, and it's now an accepted and established fact. More importantly, perhaps, all the chairs of our key select committees are now elected by secret ballot of the whole House. I put it to you, students, you can disagree if you like, but I think the case is compelling, that the probably greater than ever independence, assertiveness and effectiveness of our select committees is not unrelated to the fact that their chairs and members now enjoy the democratic legitimacy conferred by election. In other words, the chairs, Andrew Tari of the Treasury Select Committee, until recently Keith Vaz of the Home Affairs Select Committee, Margaret Hodge, until recently of the Public Accounts Committee, and now Meg Hillier in that role, have put up a terrific performance on behalf of their committees and on behalf of Parliament, and they're not fret in the exercise of their duties because they know they owe their position to the decision of a government or an opposition whip, they have the authority that results from having secured democratic election by the House as a whole. And the Backbench Business Committee, for the last five years, pressing six, has been choosing for debate subjects which the government, and very often the official opposition, didn't want <coughs> but which members of parliament want to debate, whether it be the merits of an EU referendum or the case for a prohibition on the use of wild animals in circuses or the cause of enhanced compensation for victims of contaminated blood or whatever. And some of our best debates, the review of the Hillsborough disaster, which led to a public inquiry and a reversal of wrong and historically unjust findings about culpability for that tragedy, have been spawned by the creation of the Backbench Business Committee. So they've actually been effective in our modern parliament in bringing about change that might otherwise not have happened. Now, I think other change could be made. I think we ought to have all government business scheduled by a House Business Committee, preferably meeting in public, preferably chaired by one of the deputy speakers, preferably with seats on it for minority parties and backbenchers rather than just government and opposition whips. Now, David Cameron's coalition government was committed to that, but unfortunately I think they forgot their commitment. I think in government there was some shock at the impact of the backbench business committee, whereupon the government drew back from the idea of having a house business committee to schedule government business, and that change, in my view, sadly, and regrettably, has not happened. But we've had a lot more by way of doses of reform over the last seven years than we've had doses of non-reform or worse, of reaction. Some of these changes were not popular with the whips. I mean, that doesn't, it has to be said, bother me one jot. When I was a backbencher, and indeed for much of the time when I was an opposition frontbencher, I had a relationship with my whips characterized by trust and understanding. I didn't trust them and they didn't understand me. But the whips must know their place. I mean, there is an important role for whips in a modern system of 
parliamentary and party government. There is an important role for them, but then after all, there's a very important role also in a public health system for sewers. But it's important that sewers should know their place. And it's important that whips should know their place. Whips should not be running everything. They should have some responsibilities, but Parliament has a much wider responsibility for the public good. I said that I thought that in addition to being a catalyst for reform of a legislative and debating character, the Speaker could and should be a catalyst for wider reform. Some of you I know on the Parliamentary Studies module have studied and are studying, and no doubt will go on studying, Sarah Child's report on measures to bring about a more gender-sensitive parliament, the so-called Good Parliament Report. And I think that's a really good report. We are establishing a Commons reference group on a gender-sensitive parliament under my chairmanship, which will meet for the first time in November. Sarah Child's would be an advisor to that group, and hopefully a regular attender, therefore, at it. I have selected with her agreement a number of people to serve on that group who are interested in reform of a gender-sensitive kind. Some things I might be able to do on my own, on behalf of the House and supportive colleagues. Other things might require a committee to consider and approve. Other things still, changing the sitting hours of the House, for example, if that is what colleagues want, would require a decision of the House as a whole. That's not something purely within the bailiwick of the Speaker. But I think that the proposed mechanism that Sarah has identified of having a serving and standing ongoing reference group to consider proposed parliamentary gender-sensitive reforms is a very shrewd notion on her part. It means that these matters will not be allowed to be relegated to the back of decision makers' minds, but rather will be catapulted to and will remain at the forefront of their minds, and that's got to be a positive. I must tell you that when I stood for speaker, these are small examples, but I hope valid, I was quite taken aback by the fact that we had a shooting gallery in the House of Commons, but we had no nursery which members of parliament or staff could pay for to put their children in the name of facilitating a better work-life balance. And that seemed to me to be very bizarre. And I did say that if I was elected, I would seek to bring about a nursery for which members of parliament and staff could pay to place their children if they so wish. Now, there was much huffing and puffing from people who were against, some of whom admitted they were totally against, and some of whom dreamt up all sorts of other excuses along the lines, I'm all in favour of, but it wouldn't be right to put it here. And the objection to the location that I identified was that it involved the demolition of a bar in <laughs> Parliament. That might have been unpopular with some students. But the fact is, there is no shortage of places, as my colleague Tom Watson put it, where you can get a beer in the House of Commons, but there's nowhere you can put a baby. And in the end, we decided on this particular location, and the nursery is now, I'm pleased to say, thriving, though maybe it could be improved because it is a nursery, but it's not a creche. And I know Sarah Childs feels that the next stage of reform might be to allow people to use it who don't want to make a permanent commitment, but who need short-term cover. And I'm very open-minded about that. At the time, the focus was on creating a nursery, and I think we should preserve and nurture that facility and see its extension. But if we can better it by adding a new component, we should. Uh, later on, I have to say to you that I was rather disappointed to see that although there had long been plans for an education centre in Parliament, nothing had happened. It had been in the budget of the House for years. Partly a financial crisis blew it off course, and it was thought that the really very expensive version that we had in mind had to be jettisoned, but nothing happened. And I decided to call a meeting of relevant officials and to say, look, if we want to have an education centre, let's get on with it. I then found a very senior official in the House who perfectly properly came to say to me, Mr Speaker, the House of Lords is very much against. And the reason they were against is that on objective criteria, it was thought proper to place the centre in the Lords area of Victoria Tower Gardens, adjacent to the Blackrod Gardens entrance to the House of Lords. And the Lords didn't want that. But it was actually, in terms of the logistics, the best place. 
And the senior official who was the clerk said to me, Mr. Speaker, the Commons are with you, but the Lords are against. Do you want to put the issue on the back burner for a while and try to work towards building support in the Lords, or do you want to press ahead you know, with slight risk of acrimony between the Commons and the Lords? And students, I must say, I just felt seize the moment. You know, if you drop this, it won't be for a year or two years. It'll be five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Nothing will happen. So I said, no, Robert, we must proceed. And it's up to me to try to persuade the Lords to come round. And the Lords will come round. And the Lords are now coming round. So they didn't meet their share of the capital costs, but they do now wish to use the facility. And we're most grateful to them for their interest in doing so. But that facility is state-of-the-art, cutting-edge, interactive facility which is allowing us more than a doubling of the number of young people who can come to Parliament and learn about the journey to rights and representation which we enjoy today. So that surely is a positive thing. The fact that it was also denounced and pilloried by the Mail on Sunday is obviously an additional boon as far as I am concerned. The fact they were so strongly against it must suggest that there was some very good notion at its heart. I asked the most senior official in the House back in I think 2013 whether he could tell me for sure, that everybody who worked on the parliamentary estate, employed by or contracted to work for us, was paid the London living wage. And there was quite a lot of procrastination, and it was clear that he couldn't say for sure, and he said he would check. I said, well, I need to know. And he came back to me and he said, well, actually, there's a number of people who aren't paid the London living wage. And I said, well, I think that must be changed because in the name of fairness to those individuals and because of what it says about the DNA of the House of Commons as an employer, we've got to set an example. We shouldn't have people working here who are not paid the London living wage. Everybody who works on the estate is now paid at least the London living wage. Subsequently, I was shocked to discover there'd been an arbitrary and unplanned mushrooming in the number of zero hours contracts on the estate. And I said, well, I think that's unacceptable as well it's really very unsatisfactory. There are people who are earning very, very little and have no minimum hours guarantee. So we now offer everybody a minimum hours guarantee. There's a tiny number of people who've said they don't want it, but virtually everybody has accepted it. So I hope you will feel that these are worthwhile reforms. We now have a series of workplace equality networks in the House. Parley Reach, which is for those who are not of white Caucasian heritage, Parley Able for people who are disabled. Parley Out for the LGBT community and those who want to be part of such a workplace equality network. And Parley Agenda, which is designed to encourage female staff to interact with and share their experiences amongst other women working in the service of the house. We have some of the problems of a lot of institutions that we've got a lot of for example, BME staff, concentrated, great example of occupational segregation, at the lower end of the workplace in some of the worst paid and least fulfilling roles, but we don't have that many in more senior positions. It has been an intention of mine to change that, and we've taken professional advice. We've had a whole report on how we can improve our BME representation, which involves, frankly, a shift of outlook and mindset and culture in the House, including amongst its leaders, both parliamentary and amongst the staff professional. But we also have to take individual opportunities, opportunistically, if I can use that word non-pejoratively, to broker change. So I appointed the first female and BME speakers chaplain in the history of the House back in 2010, and there was a bit of surprise at the time. And there were people who criticised, and the Daily Telegraph got upset about it, but it was the right thing to do. And everybody now says, Rose, our chaplain, does a fantastic job. Her pastoral work is brilliant. She's hugely charismatic and widely praised. But it wouldn't have happened unless I, if I can put it this way, had forced the issue. We have the first BME sergeant at arms, Mohammed Al Haji, in the history of the House of Commons. Again, there were people who cavilled at that, but I think it was absolutely the right thing to do. And we now have, following the retirement of Michael Carpenter, who was a very, very accomplished lawyer and the Speaker's Council, advisor to me and to Parliament, following his retirement, we now have Sarah Salimi, who's the first female and first minority ethnic Speaker's Council in the history of the House. I still think there's a lot to do, 
There are departments of the House where, frankly, there isn't anything like adequate female representation or BME representation at senior levels, but it's better than it was. And I think work on that front is very important because as well as being a legislature, we are an employer, and frankly, we have a million visitors. We're a World Heritage Site, and therefore, whether we look and sound and feel and come across a bit more like the country we aspire to represent and the multiracial world of which we wish to be a part is very important. It's symbolic, but it's very important symbolism. My last point, and then I will shut up, is this. When I stood for Speaker, I said, look, if you elect me, I'll do all the roles associated with the Speaker to the best of my ability, but I also will try to add a fourth. In addition to chairing in the chamber and to facilitating necessary reform in the House and chairing the House of Commons Commission to facilitate other necessary reform, House of Commons Commission is responsible for the staff services and property of the state, I will try to be an ambassador for Parliament and a robust advocate of democratic politics. Now, one of my opponents for the chair was deeply shocked by this proposition, and he conjured up a scenario of me appearing on Sky News on a daily basis giving interviews, which he said, famously, would be profoundly injurious to Parliament. And I said to him, Patrick, if I had been advocating giving daily interviews to Sky News, you would be justified in criticising me, but I was not, and therefore you are not. I'm absolutely conscious the Speaker has to be impartial, but the Speaker can practice in reach, welcoming people to Parliament, meeting students, chairing the UK Youth Parliament sessions every year as I do, hosting functions for charitable institutions in Speaker's House three or four times a week as I do, and practicing outreach, going to schools and universities and faith groups and charitable bodies, and talking about the functions of Parliament and the role of the Speaker, and how we're changing, and why it all matters, and in what way people can engage with us. And I think the days are past when the speaker can just look important, dress up in a fancy uniform, be completely inaccessible to the outside world and expect to be respected. My central proposition, students, was that if we in Parliament want to be respected by particularly young people, amongst whom there was much disengagement, we have to show respect for young people. And that's at the root of my approach. A few months into serving as speaker, one of my very senior colleagues of a rather aristocratic disposition and background, came up to me in the, when I was sitting in the chair and he said to me, Mr. Speaker, he said, I didn't vote for you. I mean, believe me, colleagues, I didn't need to be Sherlock Holmes to work out that he didn't vote for me. I didn't vote for you. I voted for George Young because I think he's a bloody good egg. <laughs> well, I think you're doing jolly well, if I may say so. Well done. Well done, he said, in a sort of bark. And I said, well, thank you very much. I'm extremely grateful. I'd just like to make my point, he said. And I said, no, no, please, please do make your point. And in a very hesitant and uncertain way, he said that he didn't understand, he didn't get the outreach notion. He said, I'm afraid I don't get it, Mr. Speaker. I don't see the point of it. Uh, speaker, very important role. I don't, think the speaker, I don't think the Speaker ought to be going around visiting schools and so forth. And I tried to get at the essence of what his objection was, because he wasn't, to be honest, very articulate about it. And eventually he said to me, well, I think, well, sir, I think it's rather below stairs. So I think it's rather beneath the dignity of the office. I don't think the Speaker should be going around school. People want to know what the Speaker does. They bloody well come to the House of Commons and listen to the Speaker in the chair. <laughs> and he said, you, you know, I mean, we provide you an apartment for you and your, your wife and your children and so forth, you know, above, above, uh, above, above the shop. Uh, and uh, you know, that's where you go and relax and so forth. Very important, very important. And my family were very deep connections with this place, as you know. And I said, no, no, I entirely appreciate that. And he said, very important. But I mean, I don't think the Speaker wants to be sort of going around the country and so forth, way beneath the dignity of the office. And I said, I think your view uh, is an honourable view. It's completely out of date. The Speaker absolutely should get out there. You in the future will pay the Speaker's salary through your taxed income. I'm occupying an important role. I'm not important at all, um, other than I hope to my wife and family. But the office of Speaker is important. And the speaker's got to be accessible to people, talk to and hear from people. So whether I'm any good or the very embodiment of uselessness in your mind is for you to decide. But in an age in which politicians are always accused of failing to honor their promises, I am trying to keep mine. I said that I would try to be a reforming speaker 
and that's what I have sought to be, and I continue to seek to be. You can either be a reforming speaker, or you can be an uncontroversial speaker, but you can't really be both. I would prefer to try to do something with the office rather than just rejoice in holding it and then let other people judge whether what I tried to do was worth it and whether I was any good at it. Thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you, thank you very much for that. Uh, so we we are being recorded. So uh, in in terms of the question and answer session, uh, I've I've suddenly uh, trans transmogrified into Jeremy Kyle. I'm walking around the audience. <laughs> if anybody wants to catch my eye for a question, maybe ask the speaker something. I don't know about the relocation of the House of Parliament to Manchester. I don't know. Um, no. Um, thanks a lot for coming to talk to us. Thank Very you. appreciate it. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in this room of having stayed up last night to watch the US presidential debates. Um, and I think one of the elements that you could sense there is the, the feeling of failure in, in the American parliamentary system. And I'm aware that the Paul Ryan does a very different job from what you would do. But as a reforming character, what would you like to do to improve the workings and the, rep um, and the reputation of the US parliament if you had a similar, uh, an opportunity to do so. Of the US Congress? Yes. Wow, that I find really, really difficult. I mean, obviously there is a big disconnect, you know, between government and governed. I find that really hard. Fundamentally, I'm rather an admirer of President Obama. I think President Obama is a thousand times better than his predecessor. You may say that that's not that difficult. George W. Bush was a hugely controversial and, in my view, damaging figure for the US presidency and the fortunes of the US and the reputation of the US and relations between the US and other countries, including this country. So, in a sense, the situation was at a low base and President Obama has greatly improved it. But I do think he's fundamentally a thoroughly good person. He, of course, doesn't have control much of the time and therefore things that he would have wanted to do, he wasn't able to do. I think I ought to tread carefully there. There are lots of checks and balances in the American system, and I'm not saying that those aren't valid. I think sometimes, if I may say so, sectional interests in America seem to be disproportionately powerful, more so than in the UK. I know their culture is different. I understand about foundation of the United States and the Founding Fathers and the terms on which the US Constitution came into being. But if you just take one example, I have to say I do find it extraordinary in light of the spate, the plethora of assassinations that have taken place using guns, that there has been no federal progress on bringing about a prohibition on the use ownership of guns in the United States, but of course the National Rifle Association is hugely powerful in America. It seems to me at some point you have to confront the reality that there might be a public opinion on the one hand and a well-funded pressure group opinion on the other. And until you grip those issues, you know, you're not going to make big progress. Uh, Paul Ryan is much more a political leader figure in Congress than I am in UK. And that was true also of John Boehner before him, who was a Republican speaker, and indeed of Nancy Pelosi, whom I actually got to know reasonably well, and of whom I had a very high opinion indeed. I respected her very much. But Nancy was very much a key Democratic player in the House of Reps, as was John Boehner, albeit quite a moderate figure in a Tea Party era for the Republicans. I mean, that's only one example. Next few years, when Parliament moves out, well, the uh, renovations are done. Do you think there's going to be much of a push to move the Parliament, and will you put up a fight to stop any members? Like I know Trucker Moon has once voiced an opinion of moving it to Birmingham or something, but will you try and stop that, or will you uh, go with it? Well, you might well to bring it to Manchester. Well, yeah, I'm not sure you will like the answer uh, to this. Uh, first of all, you know, it has to be decided by Parliament. I actually won't have a vote. I mean, it will be decided by the House. It will have to be decided by the House whether to decant, and if so, whether to decant in one go, 
both Houses of Parliament leaving the estate at the same time, which at the moment seems to be the favoured option, or whether not to decant at all, but to try to make do and mend and undertake necessary repairs while remaining in situ. Now, over the last year or two, the general direction of travel in the debate has been in favour of decant. I'll be honest with you, I'll be absolutely honest with you, I was rather sceptical about decanting, and I've still got some concerns about it, and my reasoning is that I tend to work on the basis that possession is nine points of the law, colleagues. In other words, the doctrine of the occupied field. Once somebody occupies the field, they are in command of the field. And if we simply leave, you can insert clauses in contracts and so on to try to protect yourself against this eventuality, but the danger is that you're told you'll be out for five years and you might be out for 20. Because one common feature of all public sector contracts is that they overrun in terms both of cost and of duration. And some of the people who were pressing the case for decant were very public-spirited officials in the House who were frightfully keen to see the back of us. And that made me very suspicious. And I still have some concerns about decant, but I think the expert advice that the joint committee of both houses that was set up at the request of my House of Commons Commission, the advice that they have proffered, their report is about to be debated, is that in engineering terms and practical reasons, it makes sense to get out and the work will be done more quickly and more cheaply if we're not in situ. If we're not in situ, I have to say I think it is more likely that the Commons will go to Richmond House, currently owned by the Department of Health, which is very close to the House of Commons and there'll probably be a pop-up chamber established where debate can take place. I think that's quite important because there's at least a link with our debating function very close to Parliament. And the Lords will probably go to the QE2 Centre. I think the Lords wanted to go to the Foreign Office because they thought that was suitably grand, members of the House of Lords. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to go to a rather more functional but very good building, the QE2 Centre, which may not commend itself to their Lordships to the same degree. But I think they'll probably just have to reckon with that. Why am I basically not keen on the idea of moving Parliament, say? to Manchester, or as Chukla allegedly advocates, to Birmingham. Basically, I don't really think it's a workable proposition to ship the whole Parliament formally in that way. And the reason is that although I think Parliament must scrutinise, to question, to probe, to scrutinise, to challenge, sometimes contradict or expose government is a very important part of the responsibility of the legislature and of individual parliamentarians, <coughs> Government and Parliament need to be near to each other, and all government departments are based in London, and I think that's very unlikely to change. And so, you know, to have Parliament shifted hundreds of miles away while government is based in London is going, even in this technological age, to make things very, very difficult in practical terms. So I'm not keen on the idea of shifting to one of the regions myself. That said, short of that, it's perfectly possible, and in my view, it would be highly desirable in the name of trying to facilitate engagement, an important part of Francesca's work and presumably your interest in politics, to bring politics to the great cities in a formal way by having debates in the great town halls around the country between political leaders, something actually that was common in previous centuries. Why not have if not a formal sitting of Parliament, why not have a debate between Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn, or on other occasions between Nicola Sturgeon and the Secretary of State for Scotland, or whatever, in great cities around the country? I don't think everybody is as turned off politics as is suggested. People don't like the remoteness, they don't always like the formality, they don't like the yarboo and the shouting matches and what I used to call, and I do call, the combination of yobbery and public school twittishness, which disfigures our parliament. But I think people are interested in ideas, and I think they quite value hearing people's point of view. And I did say to Ed Miliband, who floated this idea before the last election, that it wasn't for me to introduce it, but if he wanted to introduce it, because he suggested to me that he'd like to do so, I would be very happy if parliament were content to chair such sessions. And I'd be quite happy, you know, every so often, let's say on a non-sitting Friday, to chair such debates between political leaders around the country if there were a public enthusiasm for it. But in a sense, the desire has to come from the community 
And, you know, we can't impose it, or at least we can try, that if two people and a dog are going to turn up, it's not worth it. But if there's public interest, let's go for it. But that's different from moving Parliament institutionally to a region, which I think is probably not deliverable. I'd, I'd better give shorter answers. I think we have time for possibly one more question. Okay. Hi, yes. Um, the, the, some people have called for an elected House of Lords. If that were to happen, do you think the House of Commons would lose some of its powers or legitimacy if you had a second elected chamber? I don't think it's inevitable that the House of Commons would lose power or legitimacy if you had an elected second chamber. But I think the key point is that you do have to codify and delineate the different responsibilities and powers of each of the two Houses of Parliament. I think, if I may say so, the mistake in the last Parliament made by government, both by David Cameron and by Nick Clegg, was that they tried to get agreement to a reformed House of Lords. And when they were confronted with that criticism from people who were basically against an elected second chamber, either wholly or even predominantly elected, to try to assuage the concerns of those people, they said, oh, don't worry, the House of Commons will still be the primary chamber. We will have a clause in the House of Lords bill which says that the House of Commons is the primary chamber. My friend, simply having a clause in a bill saying the House of Commons is the primary chamber was not going to be anywhere near adequate to meet the needs of the case. Because if the Lords was elected, particularly if it was elected on what it thought was a more democratic method than the Commons, or if it was elected more recently after an election, a general election, than the Commons, they would of course say we've got just as good a mandate. So what is needed is for the legislation to spell out the powers of the Commons and the powers of the Lords, and the Lords would be told, yes, you are going to be either wholly or partially elected, but elected to discharge and to discharge only those responsibilities or functions provided for in the legislation. But unfortunately, the government didn't work on that basis. They thought just, if you like, a kind of rhetorical assurance that the Commons would still be in the ascendant would suffice, and it didn't suffice. Do I basically think there's a lot to be said for an elected second chamber. I mean, I suppose I should be cautious about it. I, I don't have to be, as speaker, a eunuch, but I think I do have to be sort of politically celibate, if I can put it that way. Probably ought to be slightly careful. But what I would say is I, as a backbencher, overwhelmingly supported the case for an elected second chamber, either wholly or predominantly, because I do think it's a huge problem in a modern legislature to have a House of Parliament comprised of people who are there either by accident of birth or by appointment and who have no democratic mandate. And I was, in fact, the only Conservative MP in 2007 who voted for the immediate removal of all of the hereditary peers because I really felt there was no justification for having hereditaries there. I would like to see reform of the second chamber, but if you're asking me do I think it will come any time soon, I would say no. Don't rush to the betting shop. You'll be wasting your money. Mr Speaker, I just wanted to say thank you very much for sharing your insights into how democracy works and how it can work better. It's been highly entertaining, uh, very, very insightful, and in some senses I hope you'll take away the fact that it's an investment in the future, in that the young people in this room will leave here and go into politics facing careers, and so your insights will have a lasting legacy, and thank you very much. Thank you.